It's easy to listen to the news and conclude that we have never been more gripped by the so-called culture wars. But today's guest argues the opposite, that today's conflict isn't a fluke, it's part of a long history of conflict, controversy, and recrimination. He's Cliff Nesteroff, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller, also with Salve's Pell Center. And our guest this week is Cliff Nesteroff, a journalist and historian whose new book is titled Outrageous, A History of Showbiz and the Culture Wars. He joins us today from Los Angeles. Cliff, welcome. Thank you. You know, uh, congratulations on Outrageous. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. and. Uh, I got to tell you, I was utterly amazed. Every time I thought you had mined an era of outrage and scandal, uh, there was more. Uh, and so we want to talk to you about all of that. But why don't you give the audience an overview of the book? Well, the subtitle is A History of Showbiz and the Culture Wars. And for the past several years, we've been told that you can't say anything anymore. You can't joke about anything anymore. People are too sensitive these days. Millennials, college students, there's a crisis when it comes to free speech. Comedians are under attack. We've heard this over and over and over for the past several years. And being a comedy historian, I know that this really isn't true compared to the totality of history. If you look at most of the 20th century, uh, almost everything that we take for granted today in show business was taboo. You couldn't swear. You could not talk about sexuality. You could not address uh, specific uh, politics, foreign policy, sexuality was forbidden. Most things that you're permitted to do on stage today were taboo for at least the first 70 years of the 20th century. And people have always complained and objected to things within show business, whether it was movies, TV, music, radio, stand-up comedy. Sometimes people have complained for totally rational reasons and just as often for completely irrational reasons. So this book is a bit of a historical breakdown, decade by de decade, genre by genre, of the things that have outraged people over history. And I give many examples and excerpts from letters to the editor uh, from the past, whereas today we have social media. In the old days, people wrote letters, and the tone of people's complaints was very, very similar to what you hear on the internet today. So that's the crux of the book. It's it, it, it's it's absolutely fascinating read when uh, you t when you use the term culture war. Uh, you know, I'm a historian, so I got to say, you know, define that term. What what do you mean when you say culture culture war? Well, culture war is a modern term. It's a phrase that didn't exist really in the past, but it's a political strategy essentially. It's a way of demonizing and discrediting one's political adversaries with um, really what are uh, either nonsense talking points or untrue talking points, the idea that uh, immigrants are coming for you, uh, Democrats are coming for you, millennials are evil, you know, all, all these sort of um, boogeymen that are used to deride people and sort of divide and conquer in the body politic. So, for instance, there's a character in the book, a real person, named Paul Weyrich, who is often considered the architect of the modern culture war, and it's not his opponents that call him that, but his friends, people like the conservative columnist George Will, who grew up with Paul Weyrich, who credited him with creating much of the modern culture war. He's the guy who made uh, abortion a political issue in the late 1970s. Up to that point, it was considered a, a private issue between a health care provider and the person in need of health care. But in the late 1970s, this guy Paul Weyrich said, you know, we as Republicans could acquire potentially political power if we could split Democrats, especially the powerful Catholic voting bloc, over the issue of abortion. So it was brought into politics in the late 1970s as specifically a culture war issue. So let's get into some of the examples that you discuss in, in your great book. And we're going to start with crooning. Uh, it's almost silly to say it out loud, but there was a time when crooning and crooners were derided. I'm laughing just saying it. Mm -hmm. Explain that to us. 
Well, in the late 1920s, this was a new form of music. It was really um, the, the purveyors. It was a forgotten guy named Russ Colombo, uh, very well remembered, Bing Crosby, and Rudy Valley, sort of half remembered, half forgotten. Those three sort of really were at the vanguard of this new style of singing, crooning, which was known for its sort of sultry delivery, its sort of smooth, laid-back delivery, informal delivery. And in the late 1920s, as crooning was becoming popular, uh, network radio was being established for the first time. So people were hearing radio for the first time in their homes, and this style of music was considered salacious. It was considered sexual. It was considered suggestive. This bo bo do do was considered very seductive <laughs> and a way to seduce your daughters. And so it was uh, controversial. And there were many preachers and many evangelists who were railing against the evils of crooning, that it would lead to uh, unwed mothers and premarital uh, sex. And it was sort of an outgrowth of jazz music as well, which was already uh, being condemned as, quote unquote, jungle music which was certainly a racist code. But these new forms of music and new forms of singing and also new forms of dancing, like the jitterbug, which accompanied it, were all seen as a route to uh, immorality and sexuality. And so Bing Crosby and his like in the late 1920s and very early 30s were condemned uh, by several people throughout America. Wow, wow. So uh, another example, The Simpsons. It's now in its 35th, 36th season, uh, incredible long run uh, in, in terms of TV, but when it launched, it was condemned by some. Who was condemning yeah. it and why? Yeah, I mean, this, The Simpsons today is just, uh, again, taken for granted. It's a piece of Americana, but as some people will remember, when it first uh, premiered, it was considered a bad example for children. Bart Simpson was saying things like, eat my shorts, don't have a cow, <laughs> or this sucks. And all of those things, by some people, were considered either obscene or, at best, a very bad example for children. And The Simpsons was very popular with children, as you guys will recall. Bart Simpson t-shirts were a huge fashion trend in the early 1990s, and many elementary schools, junior high schools, and high schools banned Bart Simpson t-shirts. They considered it a bad example uh, for children and school children that, uh, you know, there was a, the slogan on some of those teachers, uh, on some of those T-shirts that said, Bart Simpson, underachiever and proud of it. And this was considered a terrible example. And then in the uh, showbiz realm, The Simpsons moved uh, shortly after it premiered to Thursday nights and went head to head against the number one rated sitcom in America, uh, The Cosby Show. And initially, Bill Cosby, when The Simpsons first went up against him in the same time slot, said, I welcome the competition. But after eight months, The Simpsons edged him out. They were number one in the ratings, and The Cosby Show fell to number two. And all of a sudden, Bill Cosby was publicly criticizing The Simpsons as a bad example for children and the wrong message to send to Americans. So initially, he welcomed the competition. When they started to beat him in the ratings, Bill Cosby started a uh, quite a concerted and long campaign railing against The Simpsons, saying it was bad for America. You, you know, I, I, I probably was overthinking this. In fact, I'm sure I was overthinking this. But you, you provided a, a, a brief history of the origins of the Fox Broadcast Network, uh, which was the home of, of The Simpsons, is still the home of The Simpsons. Uh, and, you know, the, the brainchild of Australian media mogul Rupert Murdoch, uh, and it sort of carved out its own space on broadcast television with Married with Children and The Simpsons. This is the same media company that ultimately brings us Fox News. And I don't know that I was able to fully process uh, the dichotomy from Cowabunga and Bart Simpson to you know uh, Fox News in its current iteration. Uh, how does the same media company deliver both of those products? Well, very easily, if it's profitable, very easily. Corporations are not in the business of morality, even if they're selling morality. They're not in the business of immorality, even if they're selling immorality, however you might define that. They're in the business of profit. So The Simpsons and Married with Children were controversial when they first premiered on the Fox uh, Broadcasting uh, Network. At the time, it was called FBN, I think, uh, 
Fox Broadcasting uh, Company or Corporation. Um, but it's all about money. Um, you guys might be familiar with a, a left-wing history book, very popular, called The People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Sure. Um, who publishes that book? It's published by HarperCollins. Who owns HarperCollins? Rupert Murdoch. So Howard Zinn, who uh, back in the 1940s and 50s was a proud Marxist, and then in the 60s he was a uh, leader in the civil rights movement with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and then wrote People's History of the United States in the uh, early 1980s. By 1986, that book was in the catalog of HarperCollins, and Rupert Murdoch already owned that company, still owns that company. So why would the uh, guy who created Fox News be publishing Howard Zinn? Well, it's one of the best-selling history books of all time. It's an extremely profitable title in their catalog. So that's the same reason that Fox would uh, be happy to support a show like Married with Children or The Simpsons at the height of its controversy when people like President Bush were uh, criticizing The Simpsons. Um, it's profitable. So that's all it comes down to. And it's the same with your Sean Hannity's or your Tucker Carlson's or your Bill O'Reilly's or whoever else has been fired from Fox News over the years. They're profitable. So that's all it comes down to. So in terms of the culture wars, all in the family certainly is something that something you get into in, in depth and something we need to talk about here. Give us all in the family and Archie Bunker where he, that character, and that show fit in the culture wars? Well, All in the Family, of course, is Norman Lear's most famous and most enduring creation. And it was based on a British sitcom that had already been on TV in England for several years. Um, and that program had the same general premise about a sort of a cranky uh, father who uh, harbored all types of prejudice and bigotry, who was sort of sparring with his hippie son-in-law, who was the opposite uh, politically. And All in the Family really was a hit because it hit on a nerve that really was familiar to a lot of Americans. The idea of this generation gap, the father who was trying to instill a certain moral value in the children only to have them rebel against him. And uh, All in the Family, when it first was being uh, devised, made the networks very nervous. And in fact, Norman Lear had to go through two different pilots in order to get it on the air. It was originally devised in 1968. Uh, the networks passed on the pilot. They did a different pilot in 69. They passed it again, passed on it again. By 1970, they felt they were finally ready to greenlight All in the Family, although they snuck it on the schedule halfway through the season. I think it premiered in January. And it wasn't until the summer when it was in reruns that it actually started to catch on. Um, but it was also a product of uh, America being ready for it in the sense that if you look at the era, 68, 69, 1970, social mores are changing drastically in the United States. Obscenity laws are changing nationally. Movies are freeing up substantially in terms of what kind of subject matter was permissible. And so All in the Family, in a way, was the beneficiary of a changing America. Ten years earlier, it would not have been uh, allowed on network television. If you look at the sitcoms that were popular, on network TV, even not even 10 years earlier, just five or six years earlier than All in the Family, it was shows like The Munsters, Adam's Family, uh, Gilligan's Island, Bewitched, I Dream of Jeannie, Mr. Ed about a talking horse. It was all these sort of fantasy sitcoms, none of which had much uh, bearing uh, uh, in reality. Whereas All in the Family, uh, even though it too was an exaggeration and often cartoonish, it was far more realistic and far more relatable uh, to the viewing public than a guy living with a talking horse. So, so All in the Family really um, was the first, perhaps, of what you might call the modern sitcoms, and it was uh, uh, revelatory. So All in the Family has been out of production, of course, for many, many years. I don't know if it's still available by streaming or on YouTube. Do you know? Can, who's watching it now and why? Yeah, I mean, it still reruns in several markets. It reruns around the world in syndication. There's all these sort of uh, rerun sub-channels today like MeTV and Get TV and Decades Channel and some of those channels uh, show several of the Norman Lear properties. Of course you can watch it on YouTube and yeah you can rent it on Amazon or whatever. I don't know who is watching it today. It's probably the same people uh, <laughs> ironically <laughs> who, are, who are still watching 
those pre All in the Family sitcoms like Mr. Ed. Yeah. There's a whole contingent of those, uh, including myself, who like uh, vintage things, vintage TV shows and movies, and do not discriminate between All in the Family and Gilligan's Island. Today, ironically, it's probably the same demographic of people that are watching both of those, whereas in the past, when it first came out, it was probably two different demographics. Um, but of course, you know, Norman Lear just passed away, and we saw and heard hundreds and hundreds of tributes. The Emmys uh, aired this week here, and Rob Reiner and Sally Struthers did a, did a tribute to Norman Lear. I don't know if you guys have seen it yet. Um, they did it from a, uh, a rebuilt All in the Family set on the Emmy stage, uh, recreating that famous living room. So it still is uh, well known. It's still a part of the culture. And there's certain episodes of, the All, of All in the Family that people really remember. Sammy's Visit the episode with Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, will go down in history as one of the all-time great um, sitcom episodes. And one of the great things about that show, especially those legendary early seasons, is if you really look at All in the Family, it's like a play. The whole thing takes place on one set in the living room with the kitchen off to the left and the front door off to the right. But very seldom in those early years did they ever move from that one set, which is a testament to the writing, that it can hold people's attention without any real visual spectacle going on. Hey Cliff, so in the book you took pains to make clear that the, the, the combat in the culture wars is not limited to one political side or the other. And here I'm thinking specifically about the role of uh, Tipper Gore, uh, the former second lady of the United States, the former wife of then Vice President Al Gore. Uh, in the 1990s, she played a very specific role. What was it? Well, it was in the 1980s, Excuse actually. Me. But she did play a specific role. But, you know, the idea that it's not one side or the other is a little bit... Um, the, the culture war was a, uh, originally a Republican strategy in the late 70s. If we're using the phrase culture war in the literal sense, there were other examples I used throughout history before the phrase existed. But... Tipper Gore was being influenced and informed and fed material from right-wing evangelical groups. And in the 1980s, there was this uh, great concession to evangelical groups because they were very powerful when it came to sponsor boycotts. So network television and the record industry and other showbiz entities feared people like Jerry Falwell, who had tremendous influence at the time, and Pat Robertson, who had growing influence at the time. So... Tipper Gore founded something called the Parents uh, Resource Music Council, the PRMC, which opposed what they considered to be salacious music videos and dirty lyrics in rock and rap records. And they went on a campaign to try and purge such subject matter from the airwaves. And probably their greatest legacy is the parental advisory sticker that they slapped on records starting the late 1980s. That was a Tipper Gore um, uh, creation. But she really believed that musicians like Prince and Sheena Easton and Bruce Springsteen, um, and again, much of this was based on the evangelical materials that was being fed to her, were an evil influence on American youth. And they held a series of hearings in which Frank Zappa, uh, Dee Snyder of Twisted Sister, and John Denver all famously testified, all condemning the PRMC for what they considered McCarthyistic tactics. And Frank Zappa warned that it would really lead to censorship, and Tipper Gore and her counsel, which included many uh, Republican uh, wives, uh, powerfully uh, connected people, Strom Thurmond's wife among them, um, Zappa warned that it would lead to censorship. And, and the uh, PRMC said, no, this isn't censorship. But as soon as the parental advisory sticker came out, many records would not be stocked by chain stores simply because they had that sticker. So it was more than a warning. It was actually an excuse to purge certain records from the shelves. So social media, of course, was not around back then, but it's definitely around now. How has that changed the culture wars? Well, well I mentioned at the start that I chronicle a lot of letters to the editor, people complaining about what they considered the disgusting content on television, whether it be Three's Company or Dallas or Saturday, Saturday Night Live or Charlie's Angels or even going back further to I Love Lucy, um, you can find a letter of grievance if you go into the archives for pretty much anything that ever aired on television, and certainly any comedian 
In the 60s, the John Birch Society complained about Stan Freeberg. They complained about Bob Newhart. They said that they were um, bad influence because they were ridiculing American history, which was should have been, uh, you know, uh, sacrosanct. And, you know, there were all these complaints about comedians of the past. And so the key word there in letters to the editor is editor. In the old days, if somebody complained or had a problem with a TV show or a song lyric, they wrote a letter to the editor, and it was published in a newspaper or a TV guide. But because there was an editor, they didn't publish 500 complaints when they received them. They published perhaps one, perhaps two. Today, with social media, there's no editor. So if somebody complains about a comedian or a TV show or a song lyric, you get all 500 of those letters published instantaneously on Twitter or other social media platforms. And I believe this creates the illusion that people are more sensitive today than in the past. There's no editor. So we see all 500 complaints at once, whereas in the past you maybe saw one or two. You know, uh, we're taping this in early 2024. It's a presidential election year here in the United States. Uh, you're a historian, you're a journalist, uh, but if we put, look at the crystal ball for a moment, what role do you think the culture wars will play in the campaign of 2024? Well, um, it, for the past several presidential campaigns, it has played the key role. Right? It is mostly nonsense, mostly distraction. And one of the keys to the culture war is this concept that we are good they are evil. It doesn't really matter, and it's never really defined who they are, but they is everybody other than us, the person speaking and those who support the person. And so that really is what it comes down to. You vote for us, otherwise they are going to recruit your children. Drag queens are going to take over. They're going to tear down your statues. They're going to take away your comedians. They're going to take away your jokes. Vote for us, and you'll still be able to to say and think what you want. But it's always this ill-defined or very vague or very general vague. And it's really a scare tactic. It's very reminiscent of how we used to drum up support for foreign wars with a boogeyman. They are evil. They are going to uh, invade. You must support our foreign policy or, or our plan to invade this country. Otherwise, they are coming for you. Now that philosophy is domestic. Vote for us. They're going to get you. They're going to get your children. So that really is what the culture war is. It's sort of a fear tactic um, that drums up support for what otherwise would be very unpopular policies. And rather than talk about those very unpopular policies, you drum up this fear. They're evil, so vote for us and we'll save you. Is, is there, how do we break free of that? You, you document 200 years of history of uh, sort of public outrage, right? Um, how do we break free of the noise to get down to issues that arguably really matter in people's lives? Well, it's increasingly difficult because social media is one of the greatest uh, weapons for propaganda that man has ever known because it really is uh, incredible at repetition. Whereas in the old days, if a propaganda were to appear in a newspaper, you'd read that newspaper once and then throw it away. You wouldn't scroll through the newspaper over and over again all day, rereading the same headline over and over, reading the same editorial over and over. But now with social media, we do that, and we do it willingly. We don't have to be persuaded to keep scrolling through the same nonsense over and over and over. And that creates this incredible, insidious uh, effect in which propaganda is far more effective. How we break away from it, well, that's very difficult. I think the best way you break away from it is, is by presenting knowledge uh, and factual information in a non-combative way. You know, those of us um, who are interested in knowledge are often pompous in our behavior in the way we interact with people that we feel that don't possess that knowledge. We deride people as stupid rather than being patient and figuring out a way to inform others of knowledge and reality. So um, it sometimes takes great uh, understanding that other people are not necessarily, necessarily our enemy, but sometimes are the victim of uh, manipulation and disinformation that any of us are sub susceptible to misinformation and manipulation, um, you know, if we're not on guard. So I think understanding patience uh, as a teacher, uh, as a 
purveyor of knowledge is very important in getting uh, other people to understand what's going on and to get them on the side of the truth. You know, you, you mentioned, uh, Cliff, uh, all of the letters to the editor that you read. Uh, but as I said at the start of the show, there was so much here. I'm wondering, A, how long did it take you to research this book? And what did the research actually look like? The, the, the volume of the content that you present is really staggering. We have the internet and there's private archives you can subscribe to and use on the internet. And, and I do do that. There are things that you can't just find with a simple Google search. Yeah. But it's a great luxury to research in this era because I can do it from home. You know, if, if it was the 1970s, uh, like, you know, people like my friend Leonard Maltin used to go to the microfiche. They had to make appointments to get rare film prints to screen. Now I can just find things on YouTube easily and I can go into uh, uh, the archives while sitting in my underwear. I can take an edible and be stoned and just zone in on YouTube <laughs> <laughs> and, and read letters to the editor. That wasn't possible a couple decades ago. It's possible for a, a freeloading bum like me to become a historian thanks to uh, technology. And so it's a fun thing to do. The research is the most fun. It's the writing around the research and constructing it into something that is... Uh, uh, palatable for uh, a reading audience that is most difficult. Um, but the, the, the research process, you know, it's, it's hard to describe. It comes very naturally to me. It comes very organically, especially since I'm researching something like showbiz, which uh, includes movies, TV, comedy. Um, it's fun. You know, it's not a boring research process. So because it's fun, it comes naturally. It's easy. It's organic. And the end result is this new book, well, Outrageous. And I would use those adjectives to describe the book. Cliff Nestroff, the book is Outrageous, and we are so grateful to you for spending some time with us today. That is all the time. If you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on social media or visit PellCenter.org where you can always catch up on previous episodes. He's Wayne. I'm Jim, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. <laughs>